Welcome to our final About Music Education lecture of the semester. What well, the first semester it's been, an uh, absolute success, and we're looking forward to doing it again um, next semester. We're certainly not starting with a last and least, we're starting with a last and further provocations for the next semester, I really feel. I've known Alyssa's work and it's documented in here in detail, so I'm not going to stand here and read that because you're capable of doing that yourself. But I've known it since I arrived here quite a long time ago now, nearly two decades ago, and we've bumped into each other in all different parts of the music industry, if I'm allowed to use that word, and several people don't think we should. But uh, I've most uh, recently um, enjoyed her company over the last few years in the Twitter sphere as probably the, uh, the most uh, busy expert uh, composer educator that I know out there who also uh, has opinions on other things like Q&A. And, um, and, and, and most recently she was able, if it was possible, as such an amazing and, and renowned composer to go even further up in my estimation when one of her books appeared on my panel at home as my eight-year-old daughter was learning from it. So it was lovely to have some mill, not just in my Twitter life and my professional life, but also in my living room. I hope you'll make her very welcome today as she speaks on why piano lessons are so this century and not. <laughs> well, thank you. I, um, I've got too much water up here. When, um, <clears throat> when James first asked me to participate in this lecture series, um, <clears throat> He approached me to speak from the angle of my expertise on piano pedagogy and piano lessons, piano teaching. And we discussed any number of, of angles that might be a good idea to pursue in this conversation. But when I saw the lecture that James delivered at the start of this series, I knew there was only one angle that we could take, and that was looking at how piano lessons are so very much this century. Um, and the reason that I reached this conclusion is because in that very first lecture that James gave, he, I realised that he was actually calling into question and asking us to re-examine what music education actually is, how it happens, when it happens, um, what's happening when it happens, and what happens after it happens. And I thought it would be kind of fun to do the same thing in a very specific field with piano lessons. Now, when I started thinking about the ways in which piano lessons are so very much a 21st century phenomenon, uh, there were some really, uh, there were angles I didn't really want to go down. So I'm going to tell you what those angles are, and we're not going to go down them. Uh, the first angle I'm not going to pursue is the fact that piano teaching probably is the epitome of the way that market force economists would like the whole world to be. There is no regulation to this industry. I'm going to use the term, I'm going to be shameless. There is no regulation to this field of education. Anybody can just say, I'm going to start giving piano lessons. In fact, there are methods being marketed to people as a method you can teach if you've never played the piano before. So there are people out there in the world giving piano lessons who can't play the piano. And that's not at the far, far extreme, that's actually genuinely happening around the world. And I know of a number of different systems which really do promote themselves as being open to anybody to teach. You don't need a background in it. So from that point of view, there's no regulations. You can't get kicked out of the profession. Um, there's no union. So your, your rate of pay if you're a piano teacher is totally up to your own imagination and market forces. Piano teaching really is the most 21st century form of employment I can think of. No sick pay, no holiday pay, no other entitlements. I mean, we are the future. So <clears throat> that's number one. We're not going to pursue that. The second way that it might be possible to talk about piano lessons being a very 21st century thing uh, is to look at the ways that piano teaching has changed through the years. And these days, piano teachers use apps and they use YouTube and uh, recording devices and backing tracks and so on and so forth. I mean, I could stand here and, and discuss for 10 minutes at least, probably longer, um, various ways in which technology has impinged upon or augmented, supplemented, um, made a piano lesson a more interesting, uh, valuable space. Um, one thing that maybe doesn't 
immediately spring to mind when people think about piano education and the 21st century is the feedback loop that happens a lot between lessons these days. Uh, kids sending piano teachers messages on social media or just to their emails. And this expectation that children are growing up with these days that feedback happens instantly all the time and waiting for a whole week to find out what someone has to say about something is just insane when you could just send them a little message. So piano lessons are changing in that kind of a way as well. But what I'm really interested in talking about is the way that piano lessons are the epitome of what education, not just music education, I'm not meaning to compare it to other kinds of music education, but the way piano lessons really are an example of the way education could be and probably should be. Um, and to do that, I'm going to have to take you with a trip to me over to the grand piano. And um, there's not many of you, but I'm going to ask you to do that trip with me in your imaginations while you stay seated. Thank you. So, <clears throat> first thing that happens in a piano lesson, and you're all still going to be able to hear me without the benefit of microphones, happy days. Okay, first thing that happens when we come to the piano is we've got to sit down. Now, what's happening these days when kids come to a piano lesson is they sit like this. I don't know if that's telling you anything very much, but the center of gravity is very much back here, and we're just kind of at this point. Now, what I've been discovering more and more, and I know piano teachers around the world are discovering the same thing, is that when kids sit like that these days, it's not a sign of laziness or any other sort of emotional disconnection with what they're doing. They literally are not used to balancing very much. Childhood these days does not have kids experiencing their bodies in the same way that for all of history of humanity, people have experienced their bodies. So the very first thing that happens at a piano lesson is we actually explore our vestibular system because we're exploring how we balance at the piano. So just getting a student to find how they can balance forward is an interesting challenge already. This is not something that used to be part of the education of a student. They would already be able to find their balance. This is more and more becoming part of what a piano lesson involves. The next thing that, that takes place is proprioceptive awareness. Now, you might need to, to make a little list of all of these words, because I'm just shameless with the big words I'm going to throw around in 20 minutes here. So <clears throat> that first word was vestibular. It's a good one. You know, if somebody's out of balance, just you can make some nice insults there along the way without them knowing what you're talking about. This one's proprioceptive, your sense of your body in space. And having a student find their way around the keyboard requires a student to have an imagination as to their body. It seems really obvious, does it not? I mean, this seems like the most obvious thing but they have to be able to tell the difference between their right-hand side, their left-hand side, and they need to be able to think about every aspect of their body. So, we've got students having to identify where their shoulders are, where their hips are, where all of these elements are, and that's before we come to the fingers. The fingers are becoming a really important part of the challenges that teachers are finding in primary schools these days with students. Students used to turn up kindergarten year one, very, very, you know, fabulous fine motor skills we now recognize in comparison to what's happening today. Because children are now connecting with the world through screens, we've got this happening quite a lot, but these fingers are used really not very much at all, or, or maybe just as a, a unit to pick things up. So students are really struggling to identify different fingers and to be able to mobilize those fingers. So already just coming to the piano, we're dealing with, with fine motor skills issues. The next thing, of course, that happens is we've got tactile issues. Now, when we think about tactility, you might think that we're looking at velvet or silk or those sorts of experiences that the fingers might have on touching things. But what's important, the piano, is the sensation of pressure. And 
being able to experience different kinds of pressure is also something that students are becoming more and more unfamiliar with as their lives are filled with sitting still and communicating through screens or experiencing exploration through screens. So this sense of pressure at the, the piano becomes very, very important. Of course, once you actually touch the instrument, you're mobilising a new sense. You're, you're mobilising the sense of listening. And the auditory sense of listening uh, is also something that students are becoming not particularly engaged with these days. Children are not becoming so engaged with. There's a lot that's going on when we listen. First thing is, of course, we experience the sound. Second thing is we connect that sound to a concept. What does it mean? Excuse me. What does that sound actually mean? And then we think about what do we, what are we expecting to hear next? So the imagination becomes mobilized in terms of this loop of what we heard, what we're expecting to hear. And of course, all of that is mediated by the body of the student who's, who's going to play. So, in the very, very first piano lesson, the student has got all of these different things going on just in order to be able to make a sound. And, and something that children are maybe a little bit more expert at these days than uh, in the past is actually making a judgment about that sound. And that's an important thing I'm going to come back to in a moment. Um, <clears throat> Once the student actually starts to play different pieces, they're going to be experiencing all of those different things working together in time. And this is where we start getting into executive function. How much, I'm, I know we've got a very um, select audience here today, um, but how much have you all explored the ideas of executive function in the study that you've been doing so far? For those of you who are students, for those of you who are not students, is this something that's been much discussed? Um, teachers these days discuss it more and more because it involves planning and sequencing and control in terms of uh, controlling one's emotions and controlling the way that one interacts with the world. So at the piano, we have the opportunity to explore all of these things. Now at the moment, are you experiencing a bit of cognitive dissonance listening to me say all of this? You're going, hang on, whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Piano lessons are a 19th century thing. Anybody want to nod? No? OK, well, I'll just tell you, you should be experiencing a degree of cognitive dissonance at this point going, piano lessons are a profoundly 19th century thing. You should have an image in your head at this moment of a Jane Austen novel that's been turned into a miniseries where teenage and 20-something young women play the piano with varying degrees of skill and success, often accompanying other young women uh, who are going to sing, and they're doing so with varying degrees of skill and success as, as part of a pastime 200 years ago. You have that image ring true for anybody in terms of, you think of piano lessons, you kind of think that's, that's the kind of thing that's going on. It's really harking back to something from 200 years ago. And you might also have in your imagination um, a view that was very current 100 years ago of the piano lesson as a symbol of the decaying bourgeoisie. There's a film, a surrealist film, that uh, sticks in my imagination of priests tethered to a grand piano, dragging this grand piano across a living room, um, a film from roughly 100 years ago. And I remember seeing this as a student and being completely perplexed because my experience of a piano was of um, an instrument of expression and identity and beauty and joy, and I couldn't really quite understand this. But for a lot of people, when we think of a piano lesson, it's a symbol of a class. It's expensive to have a piano. Don't know how many of you have tried to buy one, but you know, if you want a really good one, they're a wee bit expensive. So piano lessons also have a class function in our cultural history slash memory. More recently, when we think about piano lessons, you're probably going to have been living under a rock if you're not connecting the idea of a piano lesson with a book that was published five years ago called Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. 
ring any bells for anybody. I mean, there's a whole there's a whole cultural expectation of what a piano lesson is that's attached to that view of um, the the lesson being a site in which the parental expectation and ambition is played out with a lot of conflict and pain and repetition, distress, ultimately leading to the child hopefully uh, finishing their grade eight exam or their diploma and never playing the piano again. Is that what, in the, the, yeah. So when I start coming along and talking about, okay, the piano lesson is gonna be mobilizing all of these things, you should be experiencing a, a pretty high degree of what's she on about? And I don't know if you're all brave enough to give me an amen, but no. <laughs> I tried, I just put it out there, you know, not enough Southern Baptists in the room. Okay, um, <clears throat> so when we're actually coming and thinking about how a piano lesson could be a 21st century thing, we do need to acknowledge that all of these ideas have been part of the cultural baggage and the cultural richness that comes with the idea of a piano lesson. So when children enroll in piano lessons today, are they coming for all of those things? And I suggest to you that for pretty much everybody, the answer is no, or even hell no. And that's because we now know a lot about childhood and the brain that we didn't know about in the past. And for everybody in the room, it might be surprising to hark back a decade or so. It probably was only 12 or 13 years ago that really it was entering the collective consciousness that learning to play an instrument had impact that was positive for your thinking. Before that, it was just a nice thing to do, you know? In the 19th century, when those Jane Austen girls were, were taking their piano lessons, not sure if you understand the full repercussions of what was going on there. There are many, many texts that actually explain, many um, advertising brochures that explain, it's a great idea to get a piano for your daughter to play because then you'll be able to hear what she's doing during the day. Now, think that one through. If you can hear what the daughter is doing, you know she's not doing other things. Just. Give you a moment for your imaginations to work there. This is quite an important thing for a particular class of people. So the piano was being purchased as a way of controlling the actions that took place in the home. And of course, in the 20th century, we've seen that the piano has been used as an aspirational tool, how to you know, rise to a different class, or it's a symbol that you can afford piano lessons for your children. It's got all of those sorts of cultural functions. So when parents enroll students for piano lessons today, what are they doing it for? I'm gonna run you through a very quick list of what's going on. Number one, they know that it makes their kids smarter. They, they now know that being engaged in this activity is going to have benefits. They might not be down on all of the ways in which it does or quite the degree of the impact that it might have, but parents these days are pretty switched on to the fact that learning to play a musical instrument is a good thing for making their child better at whatever else they want to do. So it's not so much these days about I want them to be able to play this or that. Um, that might still be a part of it, but a lot of it's about making the child able to do anything they want to do in the future. And that's where a lot of these issues come in uh, down the track, um, right from the start of the lesson, but um, down the track as well as those skills are, are built up. Secondly, parents are looking for their students to be emotionally balanced, believe it or not. That's actually quite a, an important uh, thing for parents these days. And the thing about learning the piano is compared to many other sorts of activities and uh, skill sets is that emotion is involved right from the get-go. Now, how many people in the room buy into the idea that music is completely abstract and holds no meaning? How many people go, actually, when I listen to music, I experience a sense of identity and uh, go on a bit of an emotional trip along the way? Yeah, well, see, there you go. There you go. I mean, it's, it, it is heresy in some circles, but I'm just going to Put it right out there. Music has meaning. So 
Parents know this, and when their children come to have piano lessons, they're learning how to make meaning. Not the kind of meanings that mean that they are going to go into politics and you know, convince people to vote for them. They're learning how to make emotional meaning. And how do they do that? That's where we come back to the piano. They're learning how to do that. Through touch. They're learning how to do it through the amount of pressure they put into the instrument, the way that their body creates shapes in time, in space, in connection with another material object. And all of these things that, that children can learn to do, even as simple as playing a simple tune. Do you all know a little tune that goes, um, once a man fell down a well? I love this little uh, nursery rhyme because the end of it goes, if he had not fallen in, he would not have drowned. I just, something strange, yeah. So, if you're going to play that, how can you change the mood? Because I mean, I'm sorry, that's just far too happy, would you not think, for a man who's fallen down a well and has just drowned. Simple as that. Or you could make it even more mysterious. Maybe a snake bit him first before he fell in. Or, and it can go on with any, you know. That's a completely different set of emotional meanings than what we began with. And that's just using pitch as our variable. That's without going into dynamics, without going into rhythm, without going into the whole range of things that we can do. Something else that's going on there is the balance of the hands. The piano is somewhat uniquely positioned in the different instruments in that both hands are pretty much doing the same thing, but they have to do different things. So the child has got to develop the capacity to think about themselves as, as having a debate with themselves or being able to do two different things at once. There's a lot of mental juggling that's going on in the process of creating these emotional meanings and these narratives that will take them through their lives. Now, something that education, I think, struggles with is giving students a sense of agency. Now, if you're sending your, your child as a parent to have a piano lesson that's operating in that 19th century model, the one where we, we learn the name of the notes and then we push the correct finger down, play the correct note to make the correct sound, then sure, your piano lesson is profoundly not 21st century. But when you come to a piano lesson, the kinds of piano lessons that are being taught by thousands of piano teachers around the world these days, where the child is actually being encouraged to find emotion, to find identity, to find narrative through their actions at the piano. The lesson is a one-on-one -on -one moment of discovery. That's, that's when you've actually got the piano lesson being the epitome of what 21st century learning can be. There's one other angle. I'm not sure how much time, more time I've got left to speak here. I don't want to go too long. One other angle on piano lessons that is profoundly 21st century. I, yeah, just, I'll cover this very, very quickly because I think it's pretty self-explanatory. And it's that it's one-on-one -on, -one on the whole. There are people who provide group lessons as well. But as you go on, you end up with a one-on-one -on -one learning situation. This means your education is completely bespoke. Completely bespoke. You don't have to go at the speed of somebody else your age, somebody else who happens to live in your neighborhood. It's all about you. And I think this is something where piano lessons have always been ahead of the game in terms of education. It's always been about you go where you want to go, the speed that you can get there. And we're going to be responding week by week, not just, you know, we're going to have a review every six months of your individualized learning plan, but we're actually going to be completely flexible and responsive to your learning week by week by week. And the more that piano teachers are doing that these days, the more the lessons are actually becoming um, a model for what all other kinds of teaching could be. And I'm just so aware that we've got time going on here. James, how soon, when should the questions begin? Well, should we start them now? Sorry, around. Oh, that wasn't really a finish.
I mean, I really intended for that to just be a, a bunch of stuff to think about, and now we can have a discussion. So those of you who have been to the About Music Education uh, talks before, we ask our presenters to, to speak just for 20 minutes so that there is time to make this a two-way conversation, not for us just to lecture at you. So uh, does anybody want to kick off? And if they don't, obviously I'm going to. <laughs> anybody want to kick it off? Yes, good man. There's a great question. It's a great question. Because in, in 20 minutes, I wasn't quite sure how to approach that very question. <laughs> um, immediately. You begin immediately. In fact, something that so many piano teachers around the world do right from the very, very beginning of the learning experience is they start with an improvisation. So the very first thing that a student might do is sit down at the piano and be asked to just play black keys. This is a very common thing these days. And the piano teacher might play something which creates a kind of emotion, or it might be. It's actually not a huge leap from one to the other, but, but there's a difference in emotion. Of course, you can, you can change anything. And a lot of the time, for, for many decades, and I think really for the whole history of, of piano lessons, Particular kinds of teachers working with beginners will get the student to create narratives with those things. So when, when a staccato touch is introduced, it might be one thing or, or another that, you know, rain or um, rain's probably very common. Of course, have you all seen the cartoon that's done the rounds time and time again of the piano teacher sitting the child in front of the stove and saying, we'll be having all of your lessons here until you've mastered staccato? Yeah, not that, not that, that's not 21st century teaching, no, no, no. But, um, <clears throat> but no, it, look, it's easy at the very first lessons, it's actually quite easy to do that kind of thing. The challenge really is how do you sustain the development of emotional understanding of what you're expressing through those early years? But certainly the model has been in the past, learn all the hard stuff first, like just buckle down, have spend a good five years working hard, and then you'll enjoy it. Anybody learn to play the piano that way? Yeah. yeah. And, and it's almost kind of punitive in the sense that, you know, your sins must be purged from you before you will be permitted into the wonderful world of, you know, musical appreciation. Um, but yes, right from the start. M meaning has got to be a part of it right from the start. Um, uh, I think I got myself into a, I get myself into a weekly Facebook scrap around this. Um, so, so um, where does notation come in then? Is, ah. is it different for every child because it is so individualised, mm. or is there is there a, a kind of benchmark, a way to do it? This is also a debate that I get into trouble with. This whole issue of reading, I get into very regular debates on these issues too. Um, what we're finding more and more these days is that we're having children come into piano lessons who struggle with visual processing. We're having children come into piano lessons who struggle more with all kinds of things, emotional regulation, just all sorts of things. So when it comes to the notation, um, there has definitely been a very strong body of pedagogy that believes that you start with the note naming. And it's this model, this what I call an instruction model of music, of thinking about music, that the, the score is an instruction manual. And if you can just follow those darn instructions, you, can, you too can be Lang Lang. You know, it's as simple as that. Um, <clears throat> and you know, folks, it's, it, it's that simple, just work harder. Um, actually, no. When we look at the score as being a representation of what we hear and a representation of what we understand, then we take a very different approach to teaching notation. And I think the more that we understand the way that children's brains develop, the more that we understand about literacy itself, we understand that when we read, it's not a decoding exercise 
Primarily, it is a representation of meanings which have layers, multiple layers. So I don't want to get too much into a phonics debate, but um, in terms of reading music, when we look at the notation as representing sounds that we can hear, when the student looks at the music and they can hear it already because it represents something that exists as a concept in their auditory imagination, that's when we get amazing fluency of notational reading. When we teach children to read as name the note, find the key on the piano, locate the correct finger, now depress the key, and now repeat, rinse and repeat the reading um, through, we end up with playing that sounds like that. Dung, 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 you know, as you go through, rather than seeing meanings that, that exist already. I don't know if I'm actually wandering far from your topic. No, you can give me about 500 other questions. <laughs> oh, well, I'll stop then. And <laughs> Mm. So fixed dose solfege for everyone. Movable dose for everyone. Okay. But but yeah. the fixed dose movable dose thing is a slightly different debate, and I think both of them achieve, uh, depending on how they are executed, very much in in an educational context. Both of them are aimed at achieving uh, conceptual understanding of auditory experience first and foremost. And I would say in the piano lesson, you're also layering in a kinesthetic experience. So when the student of the piano sees something, they're going to feel it in their body as well. It's not just, it's that, you know, going through multiple processes of now I get my finger involved. When you see it, you, you feel what that's going, to, that's going to feel like already from the start. There was a question. Um, I live in the typical 20th century. Mm. Yes. Um, and with my own children, I completely failed to get them involved, although I was so, you know, did act so piano when I was yes. 17. But my question is now, I'm a music therapist, so I went back in my 40s and trained as a music therapist, so I often sit at the piano and I just do the emotive thing and the children express completely, but I just can't see how the two, when you talk about the emotional side of it, mm. I know it's really important because it's my profession now, but I just find it difficult to know how you marry together the instructional part and the emotional part because a lot of it does come down to repetition and just basically getting it right in. There's, there's a, a, a saying that I say a lot, um, <laughs> which is, Yes, repetition, but it's, it's got to be repetition for discovery. It's got to be repetition for exploration, not repetition for repetition's sake. So repetition in the sense of just play it six times and then it will be right, you're working in an accuracy model of education, that if you just do it long and hard enough, you'll be accurate, which means you'll get a tick. Away you go. But if we're educating towards discovery and exploration, who cares about the tick? Who cares about the tick at the end of the process? What we care about is, what have I found out? What have I discovered? What have I learnt? Um, I think you can discover it once. I mean, you do it, and it sounds mm. good, you like it, mm. but it's still not going to be able to actually translate that into anything unless you... Why? Because it's just not there. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not in there. If you've been repeating for discovery... I agree, if you practice without the mind being there, there's no point at all, but I just... I, anyway, I could be wrong, but I just feel without the... Well, that is where the teaching comes in. I, I think that you're assuming that the teacher is not creating scaffolded experiences. Um, in, in a genuinely 21st century piano teaching model, um, the, that last point that I made of the bespoke uh, education, so if a student is, um, is struggling with a particular physical aspect of the, the engagement, then activities are done which focus on that. If the student is struggling with um, the conceptual side of things, then the teacher creates learning activities um, and, and draws on resources they're familiar with, which will help support the development of those concepts. And it's a much more complicated business than when you just bought the John Thompson piano method and turned the pages one by one and you got to the end of it and let's sit grade one. You know, it's, it's a very different approach to teaching when it's being responsive to, to where the student is at. And it does involve intelligent, reflective pedagogy. And I think that that's the missing link. 
increasingly teachers are finding ways to become trained. There, there are no schools of pedagogy which, you know, people can sign up for a master's degree in, you know, responsive, bespoke, exploratory, creative, you know, uh, piano pedagogy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But teachers are finding ways to connect with like-minded teachers around the world and create, you know, amazing things like the the ability of teachers to share their discoveries with each other has really accelerated uh, the development of this in ways that are profoundly 21st century because, again, not regulated, not mandated from above. It's a grassroots thing that's coming up from below. They don't. I need to come up with a name for them, don't I? <laughs> I that will be the next thing on my to-do list. It's a huge shift. It is a profound shift. And, and the profession um, is shifting in a kind of uncertain way in the sense that there are many people who, of course, want to keep doing things the way we all want to teach the way we were taught. Not in our heads, we don't. In our heads, we're all like, oh, that teacher who I had who blah, blah, blah. I'm never, ever going to do that. I mean, everybody in this room is, a, you know. But, yeah. I don't necessarily mean your piano teacher. I mean, I was blessed with wonderful teachers, but I mean, we all have teachers in our lives who betray us in some way or other, and we're all determined as teachers to not do that same thing. But despite that, when push comes to shove, we teach the way we were taught. Like, we just find ourselves teaching the way we were taught, unless we invest, you know, 3,000% in changing our ways. It takes a lot of effort and energy to turn the ship around. But, but there is so much good teaching that is, that is taking place around the world. I mean, I can, I can name teachers who are inspirational in this regard in all kinds of places of the world. But no, there is no school. No. Well, uh, there's no name for it at this point. <laughs> I like it. Elizabeth did say when she was preparing this but she realized she had enough to write a book about it. Uh, we have a question from Michael Webb, who is the chair of the Music Education here at Glasgow. Hi, thanks, Alyssa. Um, I just um, I sort of am going to ask a question that that um, sounds like it's trying to find out whether you're a piano purist, um, but it's not exactly about that. I, you said at the beginning there were sort of two sides to your presentation. One was that the piano was good as a corrective to a number of things that are missing. In, in, in young children's lives these days, if they're starting when they're children and so forth. And then the second half was dealing with pedagogical issues and mm. so forth. But the, go, going to the first bit, um, how do you stand vis-a-vis -vis, um, the, the question of piano or keyboard, say, uh, so that you, um, I think that there's a lot of people out there who kind of think, well, piano A is expensive, B, mm. it's big and bulky, it'll take up a lot of space, mm. blah, blah, blah. A keyboard, and even if they're intelligent enough to buy, say, one with weighted keys, mm. and, um, you know, that you know, reasonable size keyboard, and so on and so forth. Do you get the same same physical and other advantages that you were talking about um, with keyboards? Can you get anything like that? This is another one of those big debates. Um, the the instruments which deliver the best results that are digital are the expensive ones. So. The very thing that drives people to seek out a digital instrument is still an impediment to them choosing the instrument that delivers those things. Um, the world's changing quite a lot. These days, you can actually get kind of quite decent upright pianos for close to free um, if you hunt down the internet, you know, things. I mean, in my own family, my sister was just walking down the road one day and saw a really good Yamaha just sitting on the side of the road. So she went and knocked on the door of the, the, the people who were there and said, um, is that being collected by council rubbish pickup? And they went, yes. And she said, would it be OK if I just took it? And, and they said, oh, well, actually, we've got a brother-in-law who shifts pianos, so he'll deliver it to your house. <laughs> so, so basically you've got that disposable, you get rid of good instruments too. So, so, so I just, I think whereas once upon a time the, the whole money thing was 
was a thing. These days we've got videos of pianos being, you know, taken to piano graveyards and stuff. And I, I don't think the world is kind of short of pianos, really. Um, but that's not addressing your fundamental question, which is, do you get the same value when you don't get uh, the, the touch side of it? And I think this then brings us back to um, why the keyboard is you kind of... Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I am a purist in the sense that I think you will always get a better experience developmentally for the child if it is an acoustic instrument in the sense that the sound operates differently even when the sound is a perfect, perfect reproduction of, you know, it's been sampled, it's, it's beautiful and it does sound right. And if you were to close your eyes as a listener, you'd be really hard pressed to tell the difference and you'd and all the rest of it, there is, there is still something different about um, the connection of, of all of the different parts of the world that have made the hammers and the, the wool and the, the wood and the string and all the rest of it. And there's something that I think will become more and more valuable for people, that, that kind of almost hipster sense of doing it without electronics. I think there is, that there is a whole field on that side of things, but I don't have any research to back me up with that vibe, you know. <laughs> and, and there is so much as well that the digital instruments can do that the acoustic instruments can't do on the other side of things. You know, there are opportunities that those instruments provide us with. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a digital <laughs> representation of a Steinway. Yes. So I can control uh, the dynamics, the sound, the tonality, etc. But at the end of the day, I always explain to the student, you need to go back to your music teacher at school and practice also on an upright. Because most schools don't have a grand piano, even a baby. Yeah, so, these days. Yeah, these yeah. days it's got an upright piano. So because, yeah. yeah And as long as a student has got a button that can control dynamic, or a button that can control, like even if they're not using them that way, it's amazing how many students will actually turn up to a lesson and go, um, you know, they'll, they'll play in a particular way. And then when you question, they're like, oh, well, I always have this, the volume turned up really high, or I always blah, blah, blah. And there's things that the piano doesn't, an acoustic instrument doesn't let you cheat that physical experience. But it's not to say that, you know, you can't learn amazing things from a digital instrument at all. I don't mean that. Most parents are now opting because for only five hundred bucks, they can buy themselves an ADHD computer controller, yep. a bunch of studio monitors, a piece of software, because most kids have got laptops in their bedroom. Mm. Five hundred bucks. They've got a, a, a representation yes. of a, a strong way in their room. And actually, you've you've just touched on you have yeah. you've just touched on something else that's really interesting about this digital move, which is now kind of getting a little bit away from the piano lesson side of it to the what happens in the home. But really interestingly, when the child has got their instrument in their room, it becomes an extension of that kind of, you're on your computer doing your own thing, unsupervised, unconnected, disconnected from other people, in fact, in profound ways. Whereas having an instrument that does sit in the family space creates a different social experience for the student. I mean, but that's outside the purview of the piano lesson itself, but that is an interesting thing that, that takes place in terms of those meanings. Well, they need to just walk down the street and find one for free. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question. Jennifer, who is also an associate professor in music education. How rude. <laughs> Yes. Have, have that kind of 
Well, <clears throat> yes. Well, in, in actual fact, I see those um, source, source your piano lesson online as being very much of a kind of 20th century model, believe it or not. Um, it's kind of like a correspondence course where you are avoiding having interpersonal contact through this, this means of instruction. And while on the one hand that might mean a certain sense of independence and you know, personal responsibility for your own learning and all those sorts of buzzword phrases that we could mobilize to discuss what's going on there, um, because it's a physical skill, because it's a physical engagement, and because the, the children these days are experiencing increasingly restricted opportunities to know how their bodies operate, we're ending up in a situation where if the child has already spent a lot of time feeling that they're being instructed that way, um, it, nearly every student is a remedial student. But we're finding that, I mean, we're finding that is the case in many ways a lot of the time. Um, if you call it work in the sense that if, if children have not learnt to relax in their bodies, for instance, and they bring tension and, um, and all of this to their experience of the instrument, then you've got muscle memory involved in that I need to have my shoulders raised, I need to bring them forward, I need for my hands to have this kind of a shape, or I need to be using my fingers in this kind of a way. So um, I wouldn't necessarily call it um, They're just bringing the way they use their body to their playing, but they've been practicing it now as well. So instead of bringing those things to the piano lesson and right from the start connecting healthy uh, ways of being in the body, healthy ways of thinking about their body, healthy narratives for um, being somebody who doesn't develop RSI, you do have a bit of you know, work to do in terms of, of getting the student to have other narratives. But having said that, they're going to be bringing those sorts of issues into the lesson regardless. Um, it's just a complicated world we live in these days in terms of these sorts of things. And, um, and I don't think any student turns up perfect. You know, they, they don't turn up as empty slates. They don't turn up perfectly suited to the piano lesson. None of them do. So. Each one of them is their own unique challenge of experiences and interests and engagements. Um, that, that's part of the reason why piano teachers keep on being piano teachers, despite the fact that they have such poor working conditions so much of the time, because it is such an intriguing puzzle to work their way through. And I don't know if that's particularly answered. Well, this is, and look, this is the thing. Mm. This, this was actually, <laughs> this was one of the issues that was sort of on my, on my list that I was saying to James, I've got to drop so many of these issues off because when people think that they're learning to play the piano and they're learning on an iPad, it's almost like the epitome of the hyper real and what a piano lesson in the 21st century can be is the antidote to hyper reality. And, all of the things that that delivers that we don't want, learning to play the piano can, can deliver the opposite and, and be a rebalancing of the mind, the emotions, and the body. There's always, always a challenge to Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's a beautiful place to leave the discussion in here, but that won't be the end of the discussion because we'd love to invite you to join us for uh, refreshments outside. I'm going to run up there now and open the bar, but first I'm going to invite uh, Michael Webb, the Chair of Music Education, to uh, sum up the proceedings for us. Okay, well, I'd like to say thanks to Elizabeth. We've got a little um, about music education gift that give you more of the conservatory than you'll ever want. So history. Yay! <laughs> thank you! <laughs> I'd like, if, if you're in any doubt as to whether um, the piano was a 21st century um, instrument or not, you need to go to China because they're selling between four and five million pianos a year. It's the world's biggest piano manufacturer, and apparently the center of piano um, uh, playing has, uh, has um, shifted 
to China. And uh, a, stu a DMA student um, about two weeks ago showed me uh, a video clip of, um, of a sort of a, te basically a, a teaching university um, where um, for their annual, I think it was, it was like their 150th anniversary or something, they had 100 pianos on stage. Um, my first question was, um, oh, they're all being played, the same tune. But, um, and can, being conducted, but my question was, uh, first thing I wanted was uh, how well the building was propped up underneath. <laughs> um, there are uprights too. But anyway, uh, this has been a fascinating um, uh, tip of the iceberg, actually. Um, there's a lot more to discuss, and I'd like to say thanks for um, participating in the series. And even though James is gone, I would also like to thank him for getting the series up this year. Um, and this is the end of the, the successful completion of the first semester. So thanks for bringing it to a close. Thanks to James for um, mm. getting the series going. For everybody who's been to um, at least one, which is you. And uh, if you've come to multiple uh, events, I'd like to encourage you to keep coming back next semester. We're going to um, continue the series. And, and we can only really uh, do it well with um, people in the community that are deeply involved in music education in various ways, uh, coming in and uh, telling stories about what's going on uh, in, in best practice. So we really appreciate, um, Lizzie, your presentation today. And you guys for coming in for questions. And please come out uh, after James has got the bar open um, and uh, have a drink as well. So let's mm. say thanks. Thank you. Thank you.